just feel like we're in New York City. Welcome to the New York City Live Podcast. <laughs> Trump Towers, baby. We're here. <laughs> One day we're going to have our boy Donald. Donald D. Alrighty, 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 alrighty. Welcome back to Pain Points Where the World Meets Business. Here with my main man, main, 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 Samson Jugors. What's up? How are you, Bell? <laughs> It's always weird when you say my name so proper, you know. I'm here with my main man, Samson Jagors. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, uh, every week you join us, we sit down here and we discuss the ever-changing landscape of entrepreneurship, uh, expanding across multiple different domains. And this week is no different. And so here's a quick rundown of some of the areas we're going to move around and dive into. We got the uh, Saudi, we got Saudi Arabia altering its relationship with this petrol dollar, petrol dollar agreement. We're going to dig into that. We got Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, saying some pretty particular words that you need to listen to about infrastructure, currency, taxes. We're going to talk about Peter Zion. Is it Zion or Zihan? Um, I think he goes, I think it's Zion. Zion. Uh, he had an, an interesting... Zihan. 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 Yeah, there you go. Zihan. He sounds, China, speaking of China, he sounds like a Chinese person. Zihan. Um <laughs> But he is far from it. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be talking about the pending collapse of China's population. A lot of people disagree with him online, but we got some things to look at there. We have OCF Coffee House. I don't know if you heard about this, but their employees unionized and uh, did not go so well for them <laughs> in just a short matter of time. And it's a lesson there for, for small business owners. We're going to talk about Marxism and the Corporate Equality Index with James Lindsay by way of Charlie Kirk. We got the congressmen, some congressmen on the left in particular, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and I think his name is Jamie Raskin, uh, they are literally putting it right in front of our face, the destruction of the Constitution, and you just have to listen to catch it. We're going to talk about California's plan to tax their drivers per mile, and then we're going to jump into Biden, billionaires, and a few other things, and the godfather of AI, and why the NBA, WNBA is shooting itself in its foot despite having its best year. Yep. But... As always, or as a recent tradition, we're going to kick off our top four, our top five. I think I got five today. Um, Let's hammer them. Ready? <laughs> see if we can make Samson for, laugh. First one's called Men Take Care of Your Bodies. Guys, I don't always get this, but sometimes I can, I can get it. This is the right one. All right, I'm three. When I tell you to pull out a little, pull out a little. One, two, three. Ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hesitated. I hesitated. You hesitated, but I man, it looks like he hasn't jumped arm. for... Is I it? hurt my shoulder. Oh, shit. He hurts I his hesitated shoulder. hesitated and I slipped. <laughs> slipped? My man looks like I, he hasn't jumped for about just, 15 years. He hasn't jumped. Dude, I just... I, just, I, 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 I labeled it take care of your bodies because, man... They, I actually wrote a post about this the other day that specifically said... There's a transition in every man's life where he goes from working out in the afternoon to working out in the morning. Yeah. And it's right about the time when he has kids. So if you look at anybody who's very fit well into their 40s, 50s, and 60s, they're generally a morning exerciser. And at some point in time, people just kind of hang it up. And, and I know this very well. My dad was about 35 years old and he had a stroke. When he came off of that stroke, stroke, yeah, it was a chemically induced one. So okay. it was an embolism. When he came off that stroke, he got in sick shape, man. I was about eight years old, so it was very impactful on me. I remember being in the best shape ever. My little brother was born probably four years later, and that was the last time I remember my dad working out. My dad's 67 now, right? So that's a lot of years, call it 27 years, that he hasn't really just been doing anything other than just doing labor. Yeah. And he, you know, oh, I'm very active. You're not very active. And it, it shows now that he's 67 versus my father-in-law, who is keeping in very good shape. He works out regularly in the morning. It all adds up, man. Yeah. And so mom and dad, I know you're probably listening to this, but it's, Happy Father's Day. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a reality. You can you still got time. You can you can work out and and uh, make up for some of that lost time because your body will recover really quickly, but that's what you get right there. But that point right there, your body will recover quickly. Yep. All right, let's check out number two. This is uh I forget the guy's name, Jim. He's from Half Baked, if you've seen that movie a long time ago. <laughs> that's what made him really famous. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, this is not politics. This is regular conversation. I have yet to meet, I absolutely adore this human being. <laughs> Jim Brewer, Jim Brewer. Does anyone have a bumper sticker? I heart Joe. Anyone? <laughs> no, you don't. No, you 
stand up. This can't be real what's going on. I don't even think that's a real human being. <laughs> I, I, I call me conspiracy theorist. Maybe it is. I don't think it's real. I, I think it's a mask. I don't know. I just can't see. You can't. Four more years. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in his facial expressions. Yeah, dude. Jim Brewer is hands down one of the best storytellers. Yeah. He takes something that's semi funny and makes it yeah. comical. Just the energy and commitment, man. Yeah. All right. Uh, this one is called What Friends Are For. And check out the caption. It says, Bro got his spotter from Timu. <laughs> Knee case. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. He broke his neck. That's not even funny. He's, he's okay. He was okay. I, oh. I thought it was fun. The caption was the funniest part. Is that he got his spotter from Timu. He. Uh, I don't know what that is. What is that? It's it's like a, a discount Amazon kind of e-commerce oh, okay. platform where you. But yeah. So bro, you got to get in there and you gotta you gotta hug this dude. You gotta get your pelvis on his. Yes, Backside. I wouldn't have showed it if homie wasn't okay. Cause I was like, oh. I was like, I saw it too. I was like, ooh, his and, neck, yeah. man. Jeez, Louise. He, the the uh, his hand on the bench actually saved him. Yeah, two yeah. two things. Yeah. One, bail out, throw the barbell. Yeah, and if that guy's not gonna save you, then you better look out for that barbell. Yeah. Two, if you're gonna spot your dude, spot, spot him. him. I don't think that guy's ever spotted anybody before. Did, well, he he saw some instructions on Timu, and, and it did, <laughs> he's got these armbands on. It don't work. Oh my. All gosh. right, next. Take that Michigan State shirt. All right. It says, when you're trying to focus on Jesus at church, but you sit behind this guy. Literally looks like a face. It looks like a face. <laughs> just, looking, just looking at you. Seeing if you're paying attention. All right. My last two are duds. So I'm going to let my last two are duds. So I'm going to hopefully end on a good one here. All right, guys. So this is before you play. This is why you and I talk a lot about sports culture yeah. and like why we don't give a lot of time and energy to it. Um. <laughs> he, he went for it. We would define those guys right there. That guy, we would call him a weaster. You know what a weaster is? Uh, a weaster is somebody who talks about the team. They say we. Oh, we. We won the Super Bowl this year. We did. We did not do anything. <laughs> they did. They did. You just happen to be a fan <laughs> drinking beer in the stadium. Oh. Uh, man, I can't stand people who are weasters. I don't know. I, hope, I, I think alcohol was involved. Let's just hope it was yeah, for his sake. But I'm like, no, that's the danger. You get yeah. so elevated. That Put a sticker should, on that window, man. Yeah, you get so elevated. Your rational thought goes out of the window. It was, it's not, he thought it was going to be funny and cool. He yeah. thought he was going to make it to that pool. Yeah. And there was a glass thought everybody door. was going to laugh. Yeah. Yeah, they were laughing. They were laughing. I don't, he, <laughs> I don't think he's in that door. He was trying to get to that pool. You know, took off his shirt, oh, waved it around. So anyways, that's our top five. Only two of them were cut, cut the cut the... Only two made the cut, but uh, we'll try again next week. Nonetheless, it's a good chuckle with my bro here. All right, so let's kick this off, this first story here. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, there was a, they're in the news because of a lack of renewal to an agreement with the United States on. Yeah, it's technically not an agreement yeah, necessarily. It's just, it's like a verbal understanding, but yeah. let's first, let's talk about, so it's, it's regarding the petrodollar. So for the, for a long period of time, call it circa 1970s, the settlement currency for all crude oil exchange has been in dollars. Right. And that's what they've called the petrodollar. So how does the petrodollar affect the U.S. dollar? Let's start there, and then we'll talk about the story about Saudi Arabia and we'll talk about why it might be important. So petrodollars are not a currency. They're simply U.S. dollars that have been exchanged for crude oil exports. The term rose to economic and political prominence in the, the mid-1970s amid growing interdependence between the U.S. and crude oil experts. Mm -hmm. Petrodollars are paid... To oil-producing countries for their exports, the petrodollar emerged as the economic concept in the 70s. Increasingly, cost of crude oil increased the dollar holdings of foreign producers. Petro recycling is the reinvestment of crude oil export revenue denominated in dollars. The dollar status as the leading global currency preceded petrodollar's rise and has continued amid increased U.S. energy production. And honestly... The rise of the petrodollar was ultimately what saved us from the failed Brenton Woods policy. Right. 
Um, and so the rise of that, the rise of the Bretton Woods system of fixed currency exchange rates tied to gold through the U.S. dollar collapsed in 1971 because the global economy and its demand for safe assets outgrew the available supply of bullion. Only the dollar could realistically fill the void. And as a global supply of dollars grew amid U.S. trade and budget deficits, so did the accumu accumulation of petrodollars earned by oil exporters benefiting from sharply higher crude oil prices. So obviously crude has become the predominant energy source. It is used in everything. It's not just used to fill your cars, but it's you know used to make plastics and uh, petroleums and all sorts of variations of that. And so all the countries were incentivized to do that. The benefit to the United States was it was all backed by our dollar. And we've been a net importer for a lot of years of oil and gas. And we haven't had to tap our own resources. But truthfully, we have more oil and gas, more shale than Saudi Arabia. We're now just becoming a net exporter. And this is all at the same time when the Saudis are partnering up with Brazil and Russia, et cetera, to kind of create their own, what they call the BRICS union. And they're removing themselves from the dollar right. as, as the crude oil export. <clears throat> Russia, Russia, Russia exports a lot of crude oil as well. So all that to say, let's watch this Instagram post. Yeah. The, uh, the comment or the post comes from the blacklist trader. It says, this is why I trade. This is why I pick trading over every other form of business. At this moment in time, the world is waking up. The American dream they sell and they have sold for years is becoming more and more exposed by the day. The greed, the work nine to five until you're six years old, the 1% feeding off the 99%. Truth be told, there's enough to go around for everyone. For those who don't travel and don't explore the other countries, you don't get it. You never will. The air is different. The food is different. The people, although they have materialistically less than we do, are different. <clears throat> you, can, you can't buy genuine. You can't buy spirit. This is bigger than mm. the U.S. dollar. Okay. This is the rest of the world waking up to the fact that the U.S. dollar, like much of the American system, is a scam. It's built off the 1% living in a certain type of way. <clears throat> and, and truthfully, you know, we've been the best house in a bad neighborhood. That's what's kept us alive in terms of currency. And that's how it came off of post-World War II, circa Bretton Woods, circa the agreements that we made to be a net consumer instead of a net producer to help Europe rebuild. Right? Yeah. In exchange for doing that, they would they would defend against Russia and the Red Army trying to infiltrate Europe and take over effectively. And so this is a really, really, really big deal. Um, I, you know, it's, we, if you've been listening to this podcast, obviously you don't have your head under a rock. You're an entrepreneur. You're an investor. You see what's happening to the dollar. You see how much we're just printing the value of the dollar away. It's really backed by nothing. And so when the rest of the world decides that they're going to stop utilizing our currency does that value go away? And I think the answer is probably yes. Yes, absolutely. And so hold on to your underwear. Well, I have, I have a couple of things. One, when you think about it from the seat of, of you guys, the entrepreneurs, this is a, at least for me, from the way my, my mind works, I immediately go to, this is why you take care of important relationships. Because if I was a nation or, you know, I'm looking at working with the United States and, interacting with them based on the dollar. If I look at the way Washington is handling it, it's saying we don't value our relationships with the people we do business with. Right. People who have been with us for decades. Because at this point, every time we print a trillion dollars a quarter, we're devaluing the currency globally. Correct. And so everybody's uh, currency is getting weaker as a byproduct right. of our actions. Exactly. And so you're essentially saying to your, your partner, let's just say partners for the sake of the illustration, I don't need you. I don't care about your needs. I'm going to put you and me in the worst position. Right. And, and it's only so long that that's going to go on before they say, well, I'm not doing business with you anymore. I'll right. find someone, another suitor. Um, one thing I looked at when I was looking, go ahead. And look and say, no, I was just going to say it's, it's global de-dollarization, right? Yeah. So if you're looking at how much the rest of, you know, Japan, China are two largest debt holders of U S treasuries, you look at how much money we're printing. You look at the fact that the United States is essentially removing itself from the global economy and also being forced to. You look at, look at the petrodollar. Uh, it's, it's no surprise that if your economy is, is basically backed by dollars, that you would be very interested in shoring up your balance sheet yeah. and removing yourself from the equation. The one thing I found that was interesting in looking at this was since 1450 A.D., 
Uh, there have been six major world reserve currency periods. First was Portugal, 1450 to 1530. Spain um, was 1530 to 1640. Netherlands was 1640 to 1720. Uh, France was 1720 to 1820, 1815. Great Britain was 1815 to 1920. In the United States from 1921 to today. Yeah. Um, and I was just like, wow. Well, the well, average span is 94 a, years. Yeah, it's a 100-year cycle, right? 100-year so cycle. We're coming to the end of that. And so, it, yeah, without, yeah. It, it just, you know, it's going to be a rocky ride as we unwind over the next, call it seven, six years, kind of approaching 2030. It would be like the perfect timeline for that as the boomers officially all reach retirement age yeah and there's a changing of the guard and so the next you know six years are going to be a little bit of a roller coaster so yeah. keep your powder dry but continue to invest in in hard assets invest in hard assets and, and, and things like gold and bitcoin are starting to return to popularity yeah real estate not so much because it's so inflationary driven it, the only re reason it's gone up from like 1987 eighty thousand eighty seven thousand dollar median home price to Today, four hundred thousand dollars median home price is inflation, by way of printing value away. I think it's strategic partnerships too. You know, yeah, that, of course, that are gonna you know help you navigate the rocky waters. Correct, Roger that. Well, let's uh, let's move on to the next topic here, where um, someone who's very familiar with yeah, all of this related to this topic. Um, I mean, is a key player in a lot of things, very much so. Yeah, it's scary, um, scary how much of a key player they are. Somebody said on X the other day, Big Daddy Larry or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but BlackRock CEO Larry Fink, uh, obviously the clip, clip is out of context, but you can gather, you know, you still can gather what he specifically wants to say in his statements. Uh, and it's very interesting that we, we should tune in because yeah. this man is one of the richest men in the world. Yeah, so uh, this is Larry Fink talking on national debt, and no matter how we skin it, there needs to be an alternative solution. If you don't know who Larry Fink is, CEO of BlackRock, they are one of the largest. You don't know who BlackRock is? Well, yeah, you probably living, work for their company. Or you live under a rock. Um, you know, they, they own a lot of companies that you use every single day. They own the five top five major defense companies. Yeah. They get their hands in everything. They're very globally connected. The IMF and the World Bank were created 80 years ago when banks, not markets, financed most things. Today, the financial world is flipped. The capital markets are the biggest source of private sector financing, and unlocking that money requires a different approach than the bank balance sheet model of yesterday. There's still a lot of work to be done, but reform over the past eight months have resulted in billions of dollars of new dollars for the developing country's infrastructure. That's what you saw last week with the announcement of the Investor Coalition. BlackRock, GIP, KKR, and other major firms will deploy $25 billion in Asia's emerging economies. In a way, it's an Indo-Pacific counterpoint to Italy's Mate plan, which is helping African economies grow, and that's important. Every country in the world needs a growth strategy. But if I could convey one more important message today, it would be the countries that need growth most right now are not just emerging economies. Great economic powers, including the G7, are in fact on the list and need growth going forward. All of us are staring down a growth dilemma. Whether we solve it or not, it's a significant economic fork in the road for our countries. Today, the G7 average debt to GDP is 129. 129 percent. No matter how much we tax, how much we cut or reduce that debt, it will not be enough. The only way we can achieve this future of growth is by truly growing out of it. But just growth is becoming more important because we need to be focusing on our fiscal health. It is also becoming much more difficult to achieve. Within 25 years, most of the G7 countries will be a dem on demographic downslope. Working age population will decline. The ceiling on growth will get lower and lower. This is why building new infrastructure is critical, especially through public-private partnerships. Okay, you can pause it. That, yeah, the biggest, the biggest issue I have when I hear these guys talk is they talk about growth. And so anybody who's an entrepreneur, especially come from the world of tech, will will tell you that growth and scale are not the same thing. So business growth 
is about increasing top line revenue at any cost, right? So if you're a capital allocator like BlackRock, you need to be able to deploy capital in order to keep raising money, collecting fees like you do every single year. Scale, on the other hand, says, no, 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 no. We're actually going to slow down our growth. We're going to fix our costs by becoming more efficient. And then once those things are in place, then we can return on increasing our top line revenue because we've figured out how to fix our, fix our costs. Challenge is we use those terms synonymously. Mm. Growth and scale. They are not the same thing. He doesn't see a way forward for him to allocate capital appropriately if we don't figure out how to build more infrastructure. Why do we need to build more infrastructure? I don't understand why we need to build more infrastructure. Well, I, I, when I, the way I hear that, I, I hear two bookends. One, I, th- I hear what he said about the nations. Um, he full on kind of put them on blast. No matter how much you tax, no matter how much you throw out, think of all the rhetoric we've heard in the last several years about taxation. Right. He's saying that ain't going to cut it. And so I think when you talk about infrastructure, I think he's talking about um, monetary new, infrastructure. New currency. New currency. Yeah. Because, because otherwise, to your point of like when you talk about growth and scale and infrastructure, you're talking about that's a, that's a much, there's different layers and levels to where he was going with that if that's where he was going. And so I'm just like, well, he just put them on blast, on, on notice, and he just said, there's something changing. Well, it's also in a rec- if you're if you're looking at the article that we just covered before that, it's a exactly. recognition of the de-dollarization yep. of the global economy, right? And so the model that we have right now of just print and deploy globally is not going to work going forward. Yeah, I, I think you know that's a two minute clip where you know you can lull and ebb and flow through listening to that, but that's a pretty significant statement um, given his position in in the world of business, economics, yeah. and politics. And considering the fact that they hold 305,000 Bitcoin, yeah. uh, his company. Right after where he previously said it was worthless. Correct. They all say that until they're on the right side of the trade. So these are big deals, like to your point, your, how you handle your powder. and Our business owners out there are having to contemplate moving beyond the status quo, financially speaking. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Which is a, another great segue into our next topic, which is Peter's Ion, China's population yeah. collapse, and it's terrifying. Well, let's, let's just, we've already talked a little bit about who Peter Zion is. If you guys don't know who he is, Peter Zion is an author. He's written like four or five books now. He's also a geopoliticist. He studies the way that commodities, wars, demographics all collide in order to kind of determine where the world is going. His very first book that he wrote that I ever was turned on to is called Accidental Superpower. He wrote it circa 2017, 2015, something like that. That's the book you need to go read because if you go read it, it, it's like almost like he has a crystal ball of all the things that are playing out in the economy right now, which is why I give so much merit to what he talks about when he talks about it. And that's why this is important. This is him on the Joe Rogan podcast. You're saying that China has 10 years to go. At what, most. What do you mean by that? Well, we now know that they've lied about their population statistics and they're, they overcounted their population by over 100 million people, all Jeez. of whom would have been born since the one child policy was adopted. So, they're old. so this is one of those places where they've got more people in their 60s and their 50s and their 40s and their 30s and their 20s. Now, what was the logic behind the one child? Was it that they were overpopulating? Mao was concerned that as the country was modernizing, the birth rate wasn't dropping fast enough and that the young generation was literally going to eat the country alive. So they went through a breakneck urbanization program which destroyed the birth rate. At the same time, they penalized anyone who wanted to have kids. And both of those at the same time have generated the demographic collapse we're in now. And the problem with that also was that they wanted male children. Yeah, there's a cultural aspect to that too. And obviously men can't have kids on their own. You're despite what they China must say. Has yeah. <laughs> despite what some of our people think out there. Uh, but what about petri dishes? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so what's what's interesting about this is if you sit and you listen to like Ray Dalio, he was touting China quite a bit. And Ray Dalio is a pretty sharp guy. Yeah, um, He has since changed his tune because I think he's finally woken up. He says there's still some things that are good to invest in in China, but truthfully, they're in a world of hurt. And so I don't know if people understand how you know significant it is to have more older people than younger people, but the demand on the system to take care of older people is yeah. very challenging, especially when they're not contributing yes. to society. You can't really tax them. They can't work. They don't really add value. They reach a stage in their life when they need to be cared for. Yes. And who does that? Who pays for that? 
Well, I, I did a quick little search on this thing called the internet of what are the ramifications of a declining population in society. And took it to a little website called Wikipedia. And if you look here, <clears throat> they list nine things uh, that are, that really are the, the impacts of a declining population. Now, I, I referenced this thinking about our own nation and the anti-children mentality that yep. we have across two, three generations now. Uh, so look at this. Decline in basic services and infrastructure. Shout out to Larry Fink. Um, rise in dependency ratio, which you just alluded to. Crisis in end of life, in end of life care for the elderly. Difficulty in funding entitlement programs. Think of all of you who are championing for Social Security and everything else out there. Uh, decline in military strength. Mm, interesting. <laughs> decline in innovation. Mm, all you internet lovers out there, technology people. Strain on mental health. Deflation. Uh, and un- unemployment. Yep. And there, it's funny, there are other it's funny they would they would mention declining military strength because they just released yesterday a reinstatement of the draft, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the broadening of the selective service. Yeah. Correct. 18 to 26-year-olds are male and female are on the docket now to be drafted, right? And that's because they've had a lack of people actually yeah. enrolling. Yeah, and I think that the significance is the switch from it not being select or elective, um, it being a requirement. Correct. To be a candidate for it. So which which is also telling of what's going through the military's mind, Correct. right? Because every generational cycle, hundred year cycle, decline in every empire ends the same way. It ends in war. A war. Yeah. Facts. Well, uh, this is why one of the first things God said is go be fruitful and multiply. Absolutely. So <laughs> so God knows what he was talking about, guys. Yep. I know you might be questioning and, it. And honestly, this this is a great segue. You put this next article in here, how OCF coffee house employees unionize and all the locations shut down a week later. And it's the it's the byproduct of having never lived in a anything hard, going yep. through anything hard. It's the gen there's a generational gap of understanding about the Great Depression, yeah. about World War II, about how hard it was during that time period. And so when you have a lack of leadership, you have a lack of understanding and education in and around his history, it tends to repeat itself. Yeah, and, and this is just a small little sample of these imbeciles <laughs> literally making their own bed and lying in it. Like, you don't <laughs> understand capitalism. Good news, kids. I don't have to keep running the business. Yeah. Former employees of OCF Coffee House rallied outside of the now closed Fairmount Cafe on Tuesday. We've been paid really bad wages. Oh, yeah. And That's this it. is just, this was our attempt to get better wages and like make the place that we love better. The coffee shops are owned by OCF Realty. The real estate brokerage announced the closures to employees in an email, which included two other locations in South Philly. Workers like Alex Simpson say they were shocked. I am pretty crushed, especially when. It's such a blatant response to our union process. Like this comes a week after we publicly announced our union. Yeah. So what they don't understand. So it says OCF coffeehouse employees voted to unionize in Philly. And a week later, all the outlets got shut down. Now they're mad about that too. And are demanding they reopen. That's not how anything works. It's not. And they always talk about wages, wages, wages with no understanding of the burden that's put on the actual business owner as it relates to taxes. Every time they pay you a dollar, guess what? They gotta pay FICA tax. Yeah. They gotta contribute to 401k and social security. And so you, you act like they're just making a mint. One, it's a coffee shop, it's a which coffee is shop. like a super tight margin business as it is. Number two, you do not understand how the financial world and institution works. And three, for the for the it's a real estate company that owns it. So for them, it's a real estate play. They, they want the great location. It's good for the brand, so on and so forth. But they're not making a mint off of doing that. No. So no. it's easier for them to just shut it down, write it off the balance sheet, convert the property into something else, and not have to deal with woke, foolish employees. Yeah. And so uh, the owner, Ori Feibush, he actually, you know, was like, hey, rising costs, reduce sales. First of all, reduce sales. Weird. Right? Isn't, isn't that funny how that happens? So uh, you wouldn't want to go listen to this imbecile serve you coffee? And then he pointed out administrative and legal costs associated with the staff desire to organize. Because, again, to your point. Um, and so one of the responses, well, this is very disheartening. We didn't even start negotiating. 
negotiating. They didn't even ask what we were looking for before he shut down, leaving us all in a lurch via email. Because you started with unionization, exactly. you idiot. It's basically saying, screw you, this is what we want. You're going to take our offer or you're out. Correct. Okay, I'm out. I'm Great. Out. I don't make any money from this. Well, and the reason why I, I shared today, I, I brought it up for us is because um, you may not be where they are or it, or going to that degree, but I, this cult, there's this culture of, let's just say, uh, let's just say uh, financial illiteracy. Uh, I would say entrepreneurial literacy. Entrepreneur, yeah. Entrepreneurial, cor- business finance, these, these key things that there's just like a, a veil of mystery between a lot of leadership management and those who are, you know, building the company, um, not building the company, but employees. Uh, and I think that I, I, my, my thought was that I think companies that can begin to help people understand just basic level stuff, because these, these ideas are not going anywhere. And the only way to combat them is to break these things down and say, hey, this is not how it works. It might have even been a better idea to approach them and say, hey, we'd like to structure the company into an ESOP, which is an employee stock-owned company. Right. And they now all have equity in this business, and they now all have a, a, a cut and a sliver and a desire to see it grow, and all boats rise right. as a byproduct of that. But Well, and if it would have worked, it would have been way more successful than a union. Um, Correct. Correct. In a, in a coffee shop, but that's a, when you when you go straight to the unionization instead of having the conversation. What you're ultimately doing is saying, "Here's our demands. I win, you lose." That yeah. no negotiation wins that way. It's terrible. Yeah, and so to the business owners out there, I'm like, there's a, a large, considerable portion of the workforce that doesn't understand entrepreneurial finance. That it, they don't have to necessarily see all of the books or whatever it is. But I think if you can breed a culture, even in a small business, that the people understand what their efforts equate to on this quote unquote balance sheet. Um, I, I think it's, well, people think I'm crazy because in my companies, I always show the P and L to the leadership. I help them understand that like, this is how we make money. We're in the business of being a profitable company. We're not in the business of being a growth company who's right. never make making money. And so if we're not making money, then you're not getting paid. And this is how business is actually supposed to work. And Correct. so, I show those numbers openly and candidly with everybody. They can see exactly what our expenses are. They can see how much owners ownership's getting paid, how much they're making. Dude, dude, it's they're the highest. They're way more. They're making more money than all the ownership is. Right? Dude, it's I I forget the name of the company, but they're in in the apparel space. They started putting out for their customers to see all their sourcing, all their all the financials around it. Smart, and they've just gone. Phew. I forget the name of the company. They were super hot like two years ago. You remove all the the opinions, right? Because in the absence of understanding, negativity generally fills the void. Right. So I think it's a great idea. Yeah. So take notes. Don't end up like, don't, for you guys that do not, I know you guys, you work at a coffee shop and wherever you are, do not try to unionize around a coffee shop. Don't start there. Start your own coffee shop. This ain't Starbucks, man. These are small, independent, independently operated. Yeah. Go, just go start your own coffee shop. Yeah. (laughs) No, that would be too much work. Hey, so if you're a regular listener of the show, you know that we believe in entrepreneurs. In fact, we are calling you guys to regularly take action in your community and in this country. And entrepreneurs are going to be the way that we move this country forward. Well, with that said, entrepreneurs make up 70% of the economy. And there is a massive opportunity on the horizon, which is buying businesses. Literally thousands of small to medium-sized businesses are coming to the market and looking for entrepreneurs just like you to buy them. The problem is, is it's incredibly challenging and fragmented and hard to navigate. That's why we created Clearly Acquired. It is a marketplace that connects brokers and their listings and buyers with community, education, finance, weekly coaching calls, monthly webinars, weekly newsletters, and ultimately one-on-one coaching to help you buy your next business. Let's face it. Most of us are not going to go on to build an Uber or a Twitter or a Facebook. Most of us are going to end up in boring businesses, but that's where the real money will be made. Boring businesses. We're talking HVAC, contracting, concrete, people that are really creating and building this economy. So if that sounds interesting to you, head on over to clearlyacquired.com where you can sign up for a free 14-day trial and join the community. From there, you'll start connecting with other buyers, brokers, listings, get access to the course, join the weekly coaching calls, and ultimately be on your way to buying your next business. All right. So are you familiar with James Lindsay? Man, maybe. 
I think so. Well, he's like a, he's a, I'm pretty sure he's a mathematician and I, I, I just call him a, a sort of political social comment commentator, but he's far more than that with respect to him. That's just what I, my exposure to him. And so Charlie Kirk, he was hosting a Turning Point USA event, and we're going to look at two clips. Uh, we don't necessarily want to go through the entire caption, but there's this corporate equality index. And the way uh, Lindsey frames this is he's trying to give people context and help them process the decisions that corporations are making in front of their eyes. Because sometimes people are like, how can people just do this? How can they do that? Why would they do that? And they're angry. And he's trying to get people's eyes to look at the bigger picture. Right. And so. It's, it's, and real quick, this is also very telling of like the mindset that we just talked about with the unionization of the coffee shop employees. Those are not corporations. Those are small businesses. business owners. And so now they think that these same things apply to, to the small business owner yeah. and they're shooting themselves in the foot. Correct. I could talk to you guys for an hour about how ESG scores work, but let me just give you an example. Do you think Bud Light wanted to put Dylan Mulvaney's face on a beer can and lose, what, $30 billion or whatever it is? No. No. They did not. Maybe that one lady did that they let take the fall, or a handful of activists that are working in the company. But the fact of the matter is we saw immediately afterwards that the human rights campaign publishes a number called the Corporate Equality Index that requires them to do visibility activism that requires them to go testify or lobby for bills. It requires corporations to do activism on behalf of whatever its agendas are. And then that score is used as a proxy to their ESG scores, their environmental, social, and governance behavior scores, which are the most corrupt cartel system that the finance industry's ever come up with. And it's being used to push the United Nations and CCP agenda to destroy America. I could talk to you guys for... Interesting. Yeah. So ultimately, deleveraging the entrepreneurial spirit and tying it to their agenda. And so, so it's not just, oh, Bud Light is going back on their values or I'm going to boycott. You need to understand the bigger play, which is um, we're, we're literally trying to remove the spirit of entrepreneurship. We, yeah, we are. <clears throat> I've said this a couple of times and I'll repeat it that the Federal Reserve, the banks, the Black Rocks, the politicians are all in cahoots. And they're ultimately, for every time they devalue the dollar or they provide cheap money, they're perpetuating bad ideas because bad ideas can continue to exist in a cheap money environment. They can't exist in a, in a non-debt-driven society. Yeah. And as a byproduct of that, when you become a large corporation, a publicly traded company, something to that effect, they then have you by the metaphorical balls and they will use things like this to drive their agenda. Correct. And then that gets kind of trickled down to the general population and that becomes the, the view that the greater society has. And then they throw, they say, business, corporations, anybody who owns a business, they throw them all into one bucket. Yeah. And then this, this bad ideology perpetuates what people don't understand is small businesses make up 70% of the economy. They make up like 46, 48% of all the jobs. And so really they're just, every time they support one of those ideas, they're effectively cutting their own leg off. These are employees cutting their own leg off to save their toe. And it's, it's, it is a, a Marxist ideology, which is the power is ultimately in the hands of a small set of few people or groups who control all the money, all the business, all the flow of funds throughout an economy. Yeah. And so um, this is why, so when people use phrases like they're trying to destroy America, I think it's easy to think that maybe that's hyperbole. Yeah. Um, but you have to understand that America is an espouser of ideas at its core. Um, and that one, that idea is that, uh, those in power, those in government, get their just powers by the consent of their government, and that um, when that <laughs> when they seek to be just, the consent goes away. Right. Um, and so it's anti tyranny, uh, capitalism, entrepreneurship. These are all things that blossomed by way of our republic. And so when people say statements like against America. It's like, no, they actually are because of what this position does to people who want to concentrate power. Right. 
if you and I have liberty and we get to make our own decisions before God, no one can come and say that they're the authority over us. Right. And so these are, these are, this is a battle of ideas. And so he's not being hyperbolic when he's talking about the destruction of America. And so it's this wake up, it's this continuous wake up call for entrepreneurs like me and you, um, for those who are highly successful, we're starting to see that, it's, you know, perk up a little bit, but you you can't be neutral anymore. You can't. No. Because it's going to kill this republic, and we're the ones who have to keep it. And so he goes on to a second clip here, and let's check this one out. Um, I think it's the same thing. Did I put two of the same link in there? It is the same. Yeah, they're this, basically the same thing. Okay, so yeah, this, the second one, he talks particularly about the um, Marxist tactics, and, and it's, it's actually... probably towards the end, yeah. No, it's a, it's a completely separate one. Um, All right, hit it. So no, this, it, you have to go on the sheet, though, see, right? Flip over one tab. Yeah, so go up, go up the second one there. It's the same link, brother. No, this, this is, no, it's different. It's different. I promise. Yeah. Here's how it works. You divide the population into two categories. The people who are complying, who are the good guys, and the people who are not complying, and they're the bad guys. It's that simple. And what you do is you promise the population that everything is going to be good. We're going to have socialism, and it's going to work great. We're going to have racial justice. It's going to work great. We can open up the economy once everybody gets their vaccine, and it'll be great. And then you blame the people who don't comply yep. for all of the suffering that's happening that you're probably causing to them. That's what Mao Zedong did again and again and again to conquer China. That's what they did to us with covid that's what they did to us with Trump derangement syndrome. That's what they've done to us with identity politics. And that's what they're doing to us with climate change. You have to be sustainable. We, have, we heard President Trump last night, sustainable rockets or whatever it was, sustainable jets. We're going to, what did he say? Bomb the shit out of them, and, but we're going to protect the environment. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's so a, these uh, things aren't new, right? Yeah, us versus them mentality. This, this stuff isn't new. And it's just whether or not you continue to listen to podcasts like this, watch clips like that, of people who are going to tell you, hey, you're not alone in having common sense. You're not alone. Continue to stand for the truth, even if that means some peril, you know, and um, the nation needs courage right now. Yeah. It needs sure courage. Is. And so... And that comes from the entrepreneurs. It comes from the entrepreneurs because there are a lot of people that have a lot more to lose in their own perception, you know, and they, they don't have as much leverage as we have nor do they have maybe this sort of a disposition for the times they are. And so they, there's a form of leadership there, guidance, and having your brothers and sisters back of like, if our nation's calling for courageous people, someone's going to step into it. And they're either going to be of quality, of righteousness, or wickedness, right? And so, um, so let's talk about, before uh, our intermission here, let's talk about, why did I mention that on a pot? Let's talk about the next two stories here. Uh, we got the left uh, saying some things out loud on mainstream media about the destruction of the Constitution. Which Listen. is a, a great segue off of what we were just talking about. Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, uh, Justice Alito's position is laughable in this. This idea that he can be and, and the, that the court should be accountable to nobody and that the only person that they should be accountable to are themselves. This kind of scout's promise sort of uh, set up for how we should be uh, having ethics standards for the most, the highest and most consequential court in the land. It is completely unacceptable. And not only is it unacceptable, but to have any one of our co-equal branches be completely unaccountable to the others is paving the path to authoritarianism, tyranny, uh, the abuse of power in the United States, and it, it is structurally completely unsustainable. And so it is not a question on of if Congress has jurisdiction and power over the Supreme Court. It is what power are we going to exercise in order to rein in a fundamentally unaccountable and rogue court? So that, the language is very key there, right? Right. You're calling it fundamentally unaccountable and rogue. Well, there's this little thing called the Constitution that built that accountability in. Congress already has accountability intertwined 
with it. And so it's like, they're saying these things out loud because most of us don't take the time to pay attention to this. And they're telling us what they're trying to do. We're going to try to take over and do this the way we want what our agenda is within the Supreme Court. We're going to try to adjust this and do the things that we need to do to accomplish our desires. Absolutely. And it's just like, that's, that's incredibly dangerous rhetoric that they have no problem. He's smiling while she's saying it, you know, and you don't have to be a scholar in all of these things or super deep knowledge to understand. Like we've made it 200 and some odd years because the foundation was strong. And now you have people being like, well, we're going to, we're going to change the foundation just a little bit because this is a rogue and unaccountable court. How they have to be confirmed. Everybody that's there has to be confirmed by your people. Correct. You know? So it's just like, this is, this is dangerous rhetoric that we as business owners have to, we have to make choices on like, not just are we voting for these people? Maybe you need to be there. Maybe, you know what I mean? Like, well, it's, it's why you hear us regularly uh, refrain from using the word democracy. Correct. It's because we have a constitutional Republic, right? right? And there's three branches of the government for a reason. And they're designed to be independent from one another and have certain roles, responsibilities, and jurisdictions in order to keep all the checks and balances. These are all things you guys heard in grade school. Right. Um, and what they're trying to convince you of is that we actually are in a democracy and that a small group of people should actually determine the overarching decisions for everybody. And democracy is like one step away from communism and, and socialism. And so we, we do not, we have a democratic process, right. different, right? Words matter, but we do not have a democracy. Correct. And they fooled you into thinking that we do have a democracy. And uh, you actually did a video on this. Yeah, we're talking did. about that. We should, we should link that. Um, yeah, right, right. Ding, ding, <laughs> ding, ding, right here. We should link it right here. Um, because the word democracy is not used in any of the founding documents other than to warn against it. Yeah, for sure. And so, yeah, so I won't harp on it too much, but they're, 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 the lust for power is all there. We don't even actually have to, well, let's, let's skip this clip because uh, it's in the same vein. It's the same guy, but he had some different choice words and um, I won't rehash a, a dead horse with you guys of just, it's our responsibility. And the more and more we continue to- Be know, informed, yeah. educated, listen to the pod, do the research, read the constitution. And find out who's actually involved in your community, man. Who's your Congress people? Who's, your, who's the people that you are sending from your state? Do you actually know them? Like, have you interacted with them? People that work for them, you know? So these people are far more accessible than we think. They have to be by the structure that we have in place. <clears throat> right. Um, but as we continue to ignore it, they get further and further away. Absolutely. So we're kind of on the same vein of the <clears throat> Federal Reserve cheap money policy, bad ideas persisting because of high leverage and debt. Uh, California mm -hmm. is now planning to tax its citizens the the most communist of all the states in the United of States is planning on taxing its citizens 30 cents per mile to drive their electric cars uh, as they unwind oil and gas because oil and gas actually gets taxed and is what actually funds their economy. So let's hear from our value, valiant leader. Yeah, just, just look at this post. It, it's not a direct quote from him, but it gives a quick little breakdown on it. California is now planning on taxing citizens 30 cents for every mile you drive. With more than 30 million registered passenger vehicles in California, the state says it shells out more than $8 billion a year to maintain the roads those cars drive on. But because so many Californians now own electric vehicles, the gas tax money is starting to dry up, what? which is why Caltrans wants to instead charge drivers per mile and is now enrolling people in a six-month pilot program to test out the concept. The state of California is now planning on taxing citizens 30 cents for every mile you drive they claim that they aren't making enough money from gas taxes because recently. of all the electric vehicles the decision from the california government to plan on taxing citizens 30 you cents for every mile Cal you drive has garnered controversy commenters claim that you get what you vote for and that this is a bad decision from the california government but what do you think about the situation do you think this tax is a good thing? <laughs> no. All right. Well, they, they finally did the math because they're, aren't they planning to be full electric yeah. by like 20, 2030. 2030, right? Yeah. So yeah. I don't know how they're going to pull that off. Yeah. Okay. So 38 million people <laughs> in that state. 
Yeah, dude, it's, you know, it's easy to say you get what you vote for, but I think this is just the, it just shows you how far we've, we've, we have just how far we have fallen by not prioritizing like critical thinking and open, transparent dialogue, not just debate. Cause at debates, you never change your mind, right. you know, but dialogue, but I found uh LAist.com article and uh, particularly they started asking, they started polling some questions uh, from Californians. And if you scroll down, they basically say, we answered some of your questions by inquiring about them. And so if you scroll down, it, some of the top questions are just to give, give Newsom a fair shade here or a fair shake. Is the state charging the same amount for large trucks as it does for small cars? Uh, depends on which rate group you end up in in the year's pilot. So participants will be randomly assigned to one of two groups, a fixed rate per mile where everyone will pay the same or an individual rate per mile that is based on the vehicle's miles per gallon fuel economy. So this is a pilot program, um, and they're, they're basically trying to find out which path is going to be more lucrative. Uh, so one, you're going to be paid based on literally how, you, how your fuel, your fuel economy works and literally miles per gallon, so type of vehicle. Others have a more fixed environment. Um, what about rural, rural drivers and people with long commutes? Well, they're actually going to save, this is the answer, they're actually going to save money with a road charge because they tend to drive less fuel-efficient vehicles. Look at the positioning. You're going to save money. Well, who, why do this in the first place? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, how does the program account for miles driven out of state? Uh, depends on which options you choose for the pilot. There's three choices available for reporting miles. You can keep it simple and upload a picture of your odometer each month, or you can have a device shipped to your home that plugs into vehicle and shares GPS location data, oh. or you can set up vehicle telematics in a new and newer models that have connected account that have a connected account through Tesla, BMW, Hyundai, and other manufacturers. So I'll, just, I'll stop with there, but that's just some further context for us of, of how deep they're trying to go with this and put you in some test pilots. Ultimately, we're going to test these other factors. I'm going to track your car, do some other things. It, it's a mess, man. It's a mess. <laughs> it's a, get out. Of, I don't want to say get, get out of California. The, the other thing that they're not thinking about just this anti-petroleum movement is how much oil and gas is used in other things. Yeah. Facts. And so it's, it's going to be interesting. Those to charging watch. stations. Oh yeah. It's going to be interesting to watch this happen, but it, Reminds me of the Boston Tea Party, right? I mean, people were revolting like over, 2%. The, over the tea tax, right? And here we are just, I mean, 30 cents a mile, that adds up for sure. On top of nearly 50% income tax. Correct. Bruh, like <laughs> do you, do you, that phrase you get what you vote for is right. But man, I don't even, I don't even want to go there. But that guy who's in office and the people leading these things, they got to go. Yeah. They got to go. I'm just going to tell you over here in Colorado, like we're, we're a couple shades off from you guys, but your boys and girls got to go and you got to yeah, do well, something about it. We're not too far behind Colorado. No, we're, we're not. Really good at <laughs> mimicking California's laws. Yeah. And it's just a, a battle of ideas. So we're going to talk about the most trending video over the weekend, which was commander in chief, President Biden, former president Barack Obama, um, along with a few other quote unquote A-list celebrities, George Clooney, Julia Roberts, Jack Black, and host Jimmy Kimmel. This was a fundraiser in California. And this went viral because of our president's response uh, or our president's exit performance and the former president, twice removed, um, coming in to save the day. So this, pause it. So this obviously caused a stir in people. Just given, excuse me, <clears throat> given the last week or two, he's had a couple moments here with the G7 leaders. This is now the, in the same week. These are now two, two uh, former world leaders who had to put their hands on President Biden and quote unquote guide him. 
And so, of course, this went viral. Obviously, people like Pierce Morgan even chiming in. Uh, but here's the thing. This was the response that came out of this because this went viral. We'll look at a couple other angles because based on how the White House responded. So this ultimately led to trending virality. This led to journalists in the presser, White House presser, asking questions about this. And this was our press secretary's reaction oh, to this. That we need to know that it tells you everything that we need to know about how um, how desperate how desperate Republicans are here. Uh, and uh, instead of talking about the president's performance in office, and what I mean by that is his legislative wins, what he's been able to do for the American people across the country, we're seeing these deep fakes, uh, these manipulated videos, uh, and it is again done in bad faith. It tells okay. you. So now they're calling them deep fakes. So now they're calling them deep fakes. Now look at the next link. They're like, dude, you know what we can do with this AI stuff? We can gaslight everyone. We can, so so they're they're calling it deep fakes. You got people who are on the left um, in terms of social media influencers and the audience people. They're coming out. Hey Matt, you don't have to play this just yet. You know, MAGA is lying again. The new lies that Biden had to be let off stage by Obama and that he froze. This video shows what exactly happened, and it's not selective editing garbage. So you can play this one for, you know, actually, you can just skip, click, click halfway through it and then play it just because you don't need to watch the whole thing. It's just a replay, right? So we, we can recall what we just saw on the other angle, where he's at. Now he's there. Oh, oh, he's frozen. He's frozen. Same angle. But notice how the camera goes out. Yep. And Grabs then Obama. His hand, yeah. Puts his hand on his back. Right. It's literally the same video. The same video. Correct. So let's just say one tick in the gas lighting chamber. Um, but also people should know, like on the production, production says, now go to camera three. Yeah. <laughs> they, they get to get out of there. Okay. So that's one clip. Um, and now, but here's what I found. This is the best angle of them all. And this is not someone denying it, but just check this one out. This is actually pretty funny. When the time comes for a helping hand, we're America's <laughs> choice and home care. Okay, so like, these are not deep fakes. These are not cheap fakes. These are not creep fakes or anything you can possibly think of. Shout out to O'Donnell Trumpel. Uh, also, by the way, I haven't been giving credit to a lot of people who source our videos today. Um, there's a lot of you out there, Dave Rubin, Radar, Miles, Ian Miles Chong, Harry Sisson, Nick Sorter, all you guys, Pierce Morgan, of course. Um, we look forward to the pod in September with you. And, um, but... Just look at this. This is the most viral video. Government saying it's fake. People denying it. They're showing unedited clips, different angles from people's actual cell phones in the United States of America and its citizens have to deal with being gaslighted by their government. And this last clip here um, on MSNBC, one of the chief people responsible for this, check out this person they brought on. I do have to ask, though, I mean, this is all thrown into sharp relief when the two men are on stage debating, right? And it already feels like, you know, the first presidential debate is set for June 27th. It already feels like the bar that is set for Biden to clear is so much more substantially, uh, so much substantially higher than oh, the one Trump that. has to clear, which is... You mean literally beyond facing 90-something counts, 34 convictions, a, uh, a trial, removing your Secret Service potentially... Uh, banning across social media, all sorts of things. The bar is somehow higher for Joe Biden. Okay. How do people watch this crap? People and actually believe they it. They do. They do, actually. Literally, Crazy. is he alive? Is he standing? Are the words coming out of his mouth? Setting aside what the words actually are. And I just, I wonder if there's any way for Biden to overcome what seems like a structural disadvantage on, <laughs> you know, in the weeks leading up to what's going to be a pretty important inflection point in this campaign. There's they're setting yeah, the Alex, stage for them losing. I think setting that's the an important question. Uh, we don't know the answer yet. The, the, the challenge with Trump running against Trump for Biden is that they're not, re it's not really a head to head contest in which they're both being judged by the same term. I do have to ask though, this I mean, is, this is all thrown into this sharp. Is, this is bad. Like, 
MSNBC, people do actually watch this. There are dollars and people behind this that put this out. It, it, it's approved. It's it's checked off. This is bad, man. Like, this is what they think of you and I or anyone who watches them. This is what they think of you. If you, I know people who do watch, you know, MSNBC, CNBC, NBC, ABC. This is what they think of you. She's going to get up there with a straight face and say, the bar is lower for Trump than it is for Biden. And that all Trump has to do is prove that he's alive and breathing when literally that's all our president does. He doesn't do interviews. He doesn't do anything. He gives sound bites here and there. The bar who's actually it's lowered for to just show up and be breathing and standing and able to finish is actually Joe Biden. And here they are telling you that. So, <laughs> so this sparked this whole video they're sparked the, the, the Kings and Queens of, uh, pointing the finger at you and claiming yeah. the thing that they're yeah. doing yeah, and blaming it on the other, other side. So this, this sparked, uh, so Pierce Morgan shared this, right? And it got 12 million views. And so Bill Ackman chimed in on it and subsequently Mark Cuban. And so, um, Mark Cuban had this to say, uh, we, we can look into Bill Ackman's post, but you kind of can get the gist of it from listening to Mark here. He says, uh, you guys both, Piers Morgan, Bill Ackman are so consumed with pandering to your Twitter followers, you have lost all objectivity. I'll let you in. I'll let you both in on a secret. Both candidates are old, very old, which is true. They both are going to have senior moments, misremember, forget things, and have physical frailties. I'll tell you a not so secret secret. One is great at sound bites, but also thinks in sound bites. The other is awful at sound bites, but thinks in complete sentences. <laughs> Voters will decide which we prefer. Now let's look at, um, uh, click on Bill Ackman's tweet. Uh, and so he was commenting on Pierce. He says, I've been criticized by some for sharing these uh, Biden videos, which appear almost every day. Note that. I've read numerous articles which somehow suggest that the camera angle, the duration of the clip, and some form of the right-wing manipulation explains Biden's behavior on camera. Some people are old at 81, and others are sharp, vigorous, and impressive. Compare Warren Buffett at 93 and Biden at 81. Biden is an old 81 who can't find his way off a stage or stay present and focused at a G7 conference. Is that who should be the leader of the free world in, for the next five years? A president should not have to be led off stage by hand or with an arm wrapped around him. That is not the image of strength and leadership we need as a country. Look at what is going on in the world. The perception of weak leadership in the United States has led to global chaos. The reality of weak leadership is a long-term serious and continued threat to our country. The Democratic Party is destroying itself by advancing Biden a second term. This is the emperor's new clothes in real life, but it is not a children's book or a joke. The world is at great risk, and the Biden second term is a grave threat to global security and prosperity. Now, that is someone who is not a MAGA Republican, um, a billionaire, but not a MAGA Republican. And so, yeah, so long story short, uh, this, these are just the conditions we live in, guys. You have to be aware of the media you're consuming. You have to be aware of the conversations that you're choosing to not take part in that others are throwing at around you and injecting. I don't, I don't, it's, there's so much there. It's just, um, we share it cause it's funny. It's viral. It's trending, but it's also of, of grave concern. Just like Ackman said of when you're being told your president is just fine and the bar is being lowered for the other guy and my man is being helped off. And by the way, Obama played that cool, man. Obama is cool. Like <laughs> I see, you can see why he got it, man. He is cool. He even put his hand in the pocket on the other side to just play it off. Like he's walking with his buddy. He's slick, man. Um, there's so many clips, man. And so um, I won't belabor it anymore, but look at what's happening around you guys. This is what's happening. You have some important choices to make some important conversations to be a part of. Um, we'll close her down here with uh, WNBA and AI. So the Godfather, quote unquote, Godfather of AI um, actually, let me ask you guys want to close down with this one or to touch on the godfather of AI. Cause um, it's just a clip of him talking about safety. We won't dive into it really. Let's close out with this one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is, this is more relevant, I think. Yeah. So this one comes by way of Jason Whitlock, who you might have checked out his YouTube channel. Um, but he's going hard on Twitter these days. But he's actually featuring, he's, he's doing a, a quick little monologue on an article from Front Office Sports. We have the article, we may dig into it, but he does a good rundown of what it's saying and giving some of his opinions. But his caption reads, the WNBA is going to lose $50 million in its best season 
Part of the reason for that is because they're spending $25 million on private flights. He says these women don't earn, don't want to earn it. They want to be given it. Mm. So let's check this out. The WNBA's revenue hasn't historically covered its losses. Back in 2018, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver said the NBA loses an average of more than $10 million a year on the WNBA. And this year and next, the WNBA is digging an extra $25 million size hole to add charter flights, something the players have long said is necessary for both health and safety. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Let's let this soak in. They're going to lose $50 million in their best season. <laughs> and part of the reason they're going to lose $50 million in their best season is because they're paying $25 million in private flights <laughs> for a group of people that don't need private flights, but they've whined and complained their way into flying private because they don't care. They don't want to earn it. They want to be given it. They don't want to make the sacrifices that men made to build up their sports leagues. They feel like they're owed a debt. They feel entitled. One of the things I've been trying to explain to you all, gratitude. Gratitude is in short supply among feminists, among matriarchs, among people that believe, oh, if we just let women lead, the world will be saved. Women, just in general, I'm not saying all women, they're far less grateful than men. All right, pause it there. <laughs> so, I don't know about the blanket statement, uh, but yeah, those women for sure. It's just bad business, right? It's just bad business. That's twenty five million dollars that you guys could be getting paid more. Exactly. But hey, you where's the money? Like that? We talk about it. Where's the money come from? Eyeballs, baby. Yeah, and and again, if a if a business is not making money, who's how are they going to pay you more? Yeah. I saw a clip with Bill Burr. I was going to put it in here, but he was cursing too much. But he was just basically saying how there's four people in the stands. And uh, you look now, 17000 on average. Angel Reese bringing in 10000 in Chicago. These are all good business moves, and they're going to ruin it with process, bad process, bad systems, bad leadership, toxic culture. Toxic culture, for sure. They're gonna yeah, ruin there, it. There's no camaraderie amongst that league at all. And they're also going to ruin it because, you know, in entrepreneurship, delayed gratification is key. The ability to play the long game where they're like, we've been in this 20 years. This is Yes, but you're a competitive sports league that's trying to be international. Think 50 years. Yeah. And how long has the NFL been around? How long has the NBA been? NHL, right? Baseball. Yeah, base, baseball. <laughs> and so they're trying to skip. They're trying to move faster than they need to. We want to be on the same you got to build that and you have an opportunity to build that with these young rookies coming in, all these new sponsors, new people, new eyeballs, new audience, people like me who I, I always tuned in just because I'm a basketball person, but um, now I'm watching more and I'm interested more and we're talking about it on this podcast. And it's like you have an opportunity to play business, to, to do business the right way, which at the end of the day, it is a business. There's a reason why the owners always get up there first when the team wins the championship. Right. Uh, it is a business. You have it's a, just a cultural cultural dichotomy, yeah. right? They don't understand how most of this country was built, right? It was all built on the back of entrepreneurialism, capitalism, time in the game, all that stuff matters. And we're at a, at a place today where everybody thinks that they're entitled to something. Yeah. And so they're no, they're no different. They didn't do anything to build basketball, right? They're, they just are coming in to this whole narrative thinking that somehow they deserve the same and equal pay. Yeah. You know, they don't understand what that takes. I mean, pe people, even like when I played football at the collegiate level 20 years ago, do you guys know how hard it was for me to transfer? It was damn it was near hard. impossible. I couldn't even talk to the coach. There was no transfer portal. I had to speak with my running coach who had to call Colorado who gave me the plug to walk on. If I wanted to get a job, there was no NIL money. If I wanted to get a job, I had to actually file with the NCAA 
and disclose what I was doing for work. So as I wasn't getting paid under the table, right? But you don't see me sitting here complaining at the fact that now these kids are getting NIL money, making $3 million a year, right? Uh, they can transfer whenever they want to. You don't see me complaining about that right. because it was a different time. It was a different era. Why would I, why would I cry or compare those right. two things? They're not even comparable. Well, and, and also at the same time, there still was strategic talks and conversations about these things coming down the pipe and potentially working towards it, how to make it less, you know, bring it out of the shadows. And we were one of the first classes that won a class action lawsuit against the NCAA and EA sports for name, image, and likeness, yeah. because they were using all these collegiate athletes in the NCAA football game. Right. So like my circa 2008 or 2009 or something like that, I got a, I got a check for 750 bucks. <laughs> Um, that's what opened the door for the next generation. So right. they, they're more concerned about themselves. They're not even concerned about like opening the door and the people behind Correct. them. Correct. Um, so they, they don't care about that. And it's just thinking about a game. That's the thing too. It's like as a game player, like right. you're not thinking about it as a business person, as a person who has a potential to do something that impacts generations. Correct. Your own included. And so um, we talk about this now almost weekly of WNBA Adam Silver, leadership. What is it? Um, what is it? Culture eat strategy for breakfast. Yep, and that's by way of leadership. Your I mean, brain. Yeah, yeah, it's an incredible. Um, so, what's the term? Experiment. Yeah, to see business play out in real time. So, so it'll be interesting. We, we've been talking about it. the doors open for another league to come up. And that's that's take, exactly what's going to happen and take over. Because if I was Caitlin Clark playing in a league like that, I'm getting paid twenty eight million dollars by Nike. You know, I'm I got all these endorsements. Right. And I'm going heads up with these ridiculous people every single day. My my body is my business. Why would I do that? Kaylin Clark should go. Kaylin Clark, you should go start your own league, dude. You can. You know how many social influencers and audience creators will get into that and be a part. They can form their own teams, be owners of teams. Yeah. Draft these like yeah, you're hundred percent. Just I, let us be on the board because we kind of genesis. This, yeah, this is the genesis our, of the Kaylin idea. Clark, this is our idea. <laughs> when you're when you're running your own league. We'll hope you spin it up, though. Yeah, dude, it's like it, you're exactly right. That's the beauty of it. All these people with audiences and eyeballs, go fix the product. Go fix the product. Yeah, well, we'll end on that. Roger that. Well, as usual, guys, we appreciate your time with us, rocking with us every week for an hour or so here. Um, if you got value out of this, give us some likes, give us some love, some reviews online, give us some feedback, some comments, whatever it is, so we can just stay connected to you and keep a pulse on uh, how we can continue to bring more value to you each week as you navigate the ever-changing landscape of entrepreneurship. Till next week. Peace. Bro, that's crazy what you just said. A yeah. bunch of these sports. 100%. YouTubers. 100%, dude. Like, Bro, there's some, there's some YouTubes out there that have millions. Yeah, dude. And they can drink. You know what? We're just going to start our own.